guys can be seated for just just a, something that I feel really on my heart. I want to share. This is going to be short. <laughs> this is going to be short by anybody's standard, not just mine. Because short, short by mine is not always that short. But I am, I am working on it because I know you can only take in what your body can handle. I want to read a passage to you that I feel like some of you just need to hear. Uh, this was not the passage that I had planned, but pretty much nothing has gone according to my plan. <laughs> and I've got to be honest with you, I've had a great day so far. So I hope you have as well. Um, Acts chapter 9 is a passage that is an old favorite of mine. And uh, there's this man there that experienced a profound, like a profound change in his life. And uh, I want to read this little story to you. And it's just really powerful. I'll make a few comments and, uh, and then we're going to close. Uh, with another song. But in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it says this. Now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Now just to point you back to Acts chapter 8, the chapter just prior to this, you see a man there named Saul, Saul of Tarsus, who was a man that had been there persecuting Christians, and in that picture, he was a man that was holding the coats of others who were there actually executing somebody who was just simply preaching the gospel. Yeah. And so Saul wasn't the one throwing the stones, but he was the one that had led the charge, and now he's just holding the coats of those who are throwing the stones and doing the execution. So now it says in Acts chapter 9 verse 1 that he's still breathing threats and murder against, against them. And he went to the high priest and he requested letters because he's now about to leave his jurisdiction. He requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus. And that's the area that had not been any place he had authority previously. So that if you found any men or women who belonged to the way, which just so you'll know, the way is another way of saying the, the Christians. It's those who are following Jesus. So that's what's being referred to right there. That he might bring them, second part of Acts 9 verse 2, he might bring them, those followers, as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul said. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. Pause for just a second. How many of you can say that had to be a scary moment? <laughs> oh my gracious. And then when I read these passages like this, I wonder in between the period and the quotes in the next verse, I wonder how long Jesus just let him lay there. Then Jesus continued, he said, but get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless. They heard the sound, but they saw no one. Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and they led him to Damascus. And he was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. So he had that... Just take that into context there. Saul is not out there on that road alone, on the Damascus road alone. He's got people with him. The witnesses around him, they, they heard, uh, but they saw no one. They heard what he heard, but they saw no one. 
And so they take him into Damascus and they leave him there. He's obviously rattled to the core of his being because the one that he had been trying to come against with all of his energy, with all of his gusto, because these people are blasphemers and heretics, they must be stopped. That was his attitude. If they've got to die, they've got to die. But they must be stopped. Are you all with me so far? Yeah, yeah. It's a very dramatic scene that we're talking about. Come on, and so now these three days and nights, the man can't even eat or drink. Have you ever been so messed up in your nervous system? You're like, you don't, you can't eat? Well, five of you have. <laughs> That's fine. I remember when I was in Paris Island, and I, I lost, I didn't go in fat or anything. I, gosh, I was not supposed to say that. I didn't go in fluffy. I didn't go in anything was anyway, but I went in there and I wasn't there long and I was in Paris Island and I just I couldn't eat. I was messed up. I was like, man, these people are gonna kill me. I just couldn't eat hardly anything. And after a week or two I was like, wow, I couldn't even I couldn't hardly recognize myself. His nerves were that messed up. I'm positive of it. And it says in verse 10, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to Ananias in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And he said, get up and go to the street called Straight, to the house of Judas, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, since he is praying there. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and placing his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority now here uh, from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my, na my name to the Gentiles, to kings and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. Again, I stop and I think, can you imagine being Ananias? This guy that you know has come there to kill or at least arrest people like you and now the Lord's in. I, I want you to go pray for him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so verse 17 this, this moment just grabs my heart. An obedient Ananias goes and he enters the house and he placed his hands on Saul of Tarsus at that time. We know him later as the Apostle Paul. And he says to him, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road you were traveling has sent me to you so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to just stop right there in the reading and just say something that I think is so important for some of you to hear. We believe here at Life Point Hampton Roads that every person was made in the image of God. Amen. Every single person on the planet, no matter where they're from, they could be from South America, North America, Asia. Be, they can be from Australia. They can be from anywhere in the world. They're made in the image of God. Amen. Regardless of, of creed, color, race, makes no difference. Made in the image of God. Amen. They have an intellect. They have an emotion. They have a will. They're made in the image of God. And they, can, they, they, above all the other creatures on the planet, can reflect back to God the goodness of God. They can give back to God the praise that he is due, that he's worthy of. Yeah. And we can also show goodness to other people. Now there are animals and, and things that can show goodness to other people, but nobody can do for other people what people alone can do. Yeah. You see, people have within them the image of God. Now it's broken to be sure. We're not perfectly like God. I don't think there's anybody in here this morning or that will see this video later that are going to think, well, I am God. Or maybe so. 
but you're not. So, and in truth, you would know that.
left Tarsus in Greece and he went to Jerusalem and he received his seminary training right there on the front steps of the temple. And he sat there and he learned and he learned from this brilliant teacher. So this is a man that knew commerce from the Greek city that he grew up in. He knew the language, the culture of every Greek speaking person that was alive in that world. Uh, uh, in that world in that day. But this was also a man that knew the Old Testament, knew all the prophecies that were going to point to Jesus. He knew everything about what he was going to ultimately come to believe in. He, he knew the full package because he knew that the Old Testament was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. He had missed it before, but now Jesus showed up to him. And ultimately, at that point, God took everything in his past, his religious zeal, he took from being what he was before to that moment after the Damascus Road and turned that into following Jesus. It, he used that to, to make this guy that was a persecutor to being a preacher to all the Gentiles that he could ever find. This was a man that went on multiple missionary trips, took the gospel around the world. He took it to Asia. He took it to Europe. He took it all over the place. Are you all with me? Yes. And the reason that he could go into a Greek-speaking place or into a place where you've got a bunch of Hebrew people who are still believing the old covenant is the way, he could go into any environment and he could speak to them with simple authenticity and humility was because though the world would look at him and, and, and qualify him as one thing or another, God looks at him and says, I'm making him a, a, a Greek speaking, or excuse me, a Greek speaking intelligent young man, and also I'm going to make him with a zeal for my law. I'm going to make him with a zeal for my name. I'm going to make him have a heart for eternity. I'm going to put within him everything that I would need to make him a great man of God. Now, here's what I want you to know. 13 of your 26 New Testament, how many New Testament books? 26? I just forgot that right in front of you. <laughs> Sin against you can be used for his glory. 